Hello and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech 24, France 24's tech show. As parliamentary elections are about to kick off, the EU Commission and tech giants are bracing for a one-of-a-kind battle against disinformation and hate speech. In this edition, we speak to Eline Shivo, a senior policy analyst at the Center for Data Innovation, about what can be done to safeguard election processes. And in Test 24, we try the Easy Gain, a treadmill that is designed to help people learn how to walk after sustaining an injury or a disability. Now, what if the train of the future were to be powered by hydrogen? Such a prototype dubbed the Space Train is to be tested here in France between the cities of Paris and Orléans on a concrete railroad. Tracks that were built in the 1970s to accommodate yet another innovative train as Olivia Salazar Winspear explains. Gliding along on a cushion of air, its frictionless technology will allow the space train to reach speeds of up to 500 kilometers an hour. Yet this futuristic train is inspired by the past. Its ancestor is engineer Jean Bertin's aero train, which set a world speed record thanks to its jet engine on a trip between Paris and Orléans. Yet it was retired in 1974 due to the oil crisis at the time. The space train is back then, and this time adhering to 21st century requirements. Price, speed and the environment. We were focusing on these three issues when we were developing this mode of transport. It needed to be fast, affordable and environmentally friendly. At this speed, a Paris-Orléans trip will take 15 minutes and the ticket should cost around 15 euros. And since it's powered by hydrogen, it won't create any toxic emissions. The onboard hydrogen fuel cells will create the electricity necessary to power the engine. The magnetic field of the engine will exert its force on this concrete railway left over from the time of the aerotrain and will propel the space train forward at super high speed. Its developers are currently working in a studio nearby, testing out a propulsion system using a linear electric motor where they replicate the conditions that will thrust the train forward. This innovative design is simply a response to a pressing demand, created to complete France's high-speed rail network and link up the country's medium-sized towns. But could it become a viable option in the transport market? This exhibition at Paris's Science Museum is exploring high-speed railways and they're asking the same question about trains of the future. We need to experiment. Railways need to evolve. It's worth taking a closer look at any new innovations. I can't predict what will happen first because I think it's the market that will decide, the economy will decide and then we'll have to see who's going to take a risk and invest in it. The government's recently moved to deploy hydrogen-powered trains to interregional routes between 2024 and 2028. And if the space train secures sufficient financing, it could be operational by 2025. In order to stop potential interferences in the upcoming European parliamentary elections, the EU Commission has strengthened its battle against the circulation of so-called fake news. Several million euros have been allocated to this struggle, and there will be a particular focus on internet platforms. Well, to talk more about this, let's cross over to Eline Shivo, Senior Policy Analyst at the Center for Data Innovation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Hello. So how important is this fake news problem ahead of these parliamentary elections in Europe? So an important general point to, to, to keep in mind is that we're not able to say much yet about the actual scope and scale and reach of the problem, uh, the circulation of disinformation, how many people it affects, how effective it is in actually swaying political opinions. So we're missing that understanding. So we'll probably need uh, longer term studies and research to measure all that more accurately. Uh, now, regarding EU elections, I believe that it should rather be a safe process, but maybe not in all EU countries. Um, and concerns are that the magnitude of the vote with 28 countries voting and the fact that many European citizens may be unfamiliar with uh, EU politics, that would increase vulnerabilities to disinformation uh, campaigns. Now, looking at country-specific impact of disinformation and what we can expect, the level of preparedness and resilience 
elections differ across countries. So during Finland's elections in April, for instance, there has been no wide scale uh, interference, but we definitely cannot say the same about Spain. Um, and also some countries are less likely to be targeted rather than others because they're less interested markets of voters to those actors meddling in elections because, you know, they're smaller or they're already quite Eurosceptic anyway. Uh, and there's this fragmentation across the EU in terms of the rules for campaigning, voting infrastructure, etc. So there's really a role for the EU to coordinate the effort and the fight against disinformation. How can AI uh, in particular help fighting against uh, disinformation? Why is this tool so powerful in a way? So it's true, using algorithms can accelerate the fact-checking and debunking process um, quite significantly. Uh, and it's acting as a first defense against harmful uh, content, uh, which because it sifts through uh, content quickly before it can even reach its targets or be seen or posted. Uh, and platforms have been exploring solutions, taking action by building more neutral algorithms, uh, running and rolling out hundreds of thousands of experiments and changes on their algorithms. You can tweak algorithms to suggest or redirect or prioritize results uh, that debunk, for instance, conspiracy theories by providing an official source as the first uh, result. Um, and certain tools can recognize with great uh, accuracy certain types of content. Uh, like terrorist propaganda. Um, I think to give you an example, uh, Facebook's algorithm are able to remove that in 99% of the cases. Uh, now, I'd like to point out that, of course, the technology is improving and getting better, uh, but it's not a silver bullet, uh, and there are limits to automated social media content analysis. Uh, AI, for instance, does not understand context. They cannot define what's the truth. Um, so they are definitely, it's important to be careful uh, when, when it comes to expectations about AI. Eileen Shivo, Senior Policy Analyst uh, from the Data for Innovation Center in Brussels. Thank you so much for that. Thank you very much. And we're going to turn to our in-house expert, Dan and Jay Cattlecar. Hello, Dan. Hello, Julia. Internet platforms like Facebook are being asked to show what they're doing to stop disinformation and hate speech. And in that regard, Facebook has set up, it looks like a war room. How does it, how does it work? Well, yes, this operations center is based in Dublin, and it is staffed with 40 people, which consists of data scientists and engineers. And they are supported by a global network of other scientists and engineers. Well, first of all, Facebook has uh, tied up with uh, fact-checking organizations, so uh, they will be able to either remove or flag uh, disinformation or fake news, whatever the fact-checking organizations organization suggest. Secondly, they have also made political uh, advertisement uh, very transparent, so now for any person or a group who wants to post an advertisement, they have to be based in the country where the ads are going to target the users, and there's a lot of transparency about the ads themselves. So uh, the amount of money that was spent on the ads, who put these ads, and what was the target of these ads is, uh, is made clear. That's one part. Secondly, uh, Facebook is, of course, owns WhatsApp. So tracking what's happening on WhatsApp is also important. But with WhatsApp, most of the messages are in closed groups. So in order to tackle that, uh, Facebook has now limited the amount of information that can be forwarded uh, on the WhatsApp platform. So these are some of the uh, some of the measures that Facebook has undertaken. Now, Microsoft has also announced uh, the creation of a new platform to try to secure voting. It's open source and it's called Election Guard. Yes, Election Guard will first of all let voters confirm that their votes are accurately recorded. And secondly, every time a vote is cast, coded trackers will create an encrypted version of the vote so that the votes are accurately counted. Now, this is very important because uh, the counting of the votes can be uh, used, for example, in post-election analysis, or it can be also used for recounts. So, so this is uh, one of the, uh, I think, important innovations in, uh, in modern-day elections that Microsoft is proposing, and it will be available at the beginning of the summer. Thank you so much, Dan and Jay Cattlecar. We're going to move on to Test24. It's a device that's set to help many people around the world who are learning how to walk again. Dan, EasyGain is a one-of-a-kind treadmill. Tell us more about it. Well, yes, the key characteristic of this uh, connected gait uh, rehabilitation treadmill is that the weight lightening is achieved with the help of a harness that attached to the pelvis. Uh, this uh, gives you a higher degree of freedom because unlike those which are at the upper torso, this uh, makes it more compact, so you don't need, it doesn't occupy a lot of space. 
So what you do is the patient no uh, normally wears, wears a harness, and then this harness is attached to these two straps. Once these straps are attached, uh, you can take control of this machine by using this uh, remote control. Uh, this, these straps are able to withstand weight of up to 130 kilograms. So you can start this machine and it will start lifting. And I can feel it and I feel the, the weight lightening and you can stop depending on your height. And then you can start the treadmill itself. And there are multiple applications on this uh, tab using which you can uh, undergo rehabilitation. So for example, I'm playing this video which shows uh, the ped a pedestrian path in Tokyo. So it, as I'm walking, I can uh, see the sights and sounds of Tokyo. You can change the speed of the treadmill again with one of these buttons. All the data about uh, the the speed, the amount of steps you have taken, the amount of weight that was held by these two straps is recorded on this app. And then there is an, another interesting feature on this app, which is a game, uh, which tells you how to basically be in equilibrium. And at the same time, you can uh, attain balance uh, by moving in, on that spot by keeping your legs fixed. So here is an example. So you can adjust the way the cannons are shot by moving your upper body. This is to maintain balance uh, in this equilibrium position. Now this treadmill is set to help people who have suffered from an injury, for instance, but it can also help the elderly. Absolutely. In fact, the idea of this system was born after discussions with uh, doctors who uh, were doctors of a rehabilitation center and also after discussions with people, elderly people. So yes, uh, it has, it has uh, multiple use. Dan and Jay, thank you so much for that. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech 24. But you can watch it again on our website, france24.com. See you next time.